Hey everyone, Ultra Healthy Video Game Nerd here, back in action. Guys, last time I did a video about Koryun and tried to warn collectors about it because the gameplay itself isn't really worth the price tag in my opinion. One of the reasons that I started doing these videos in the first place is that classic games have become so expensive, I thought that giving honest reviews would be helpful for people considering buying really expensive games. Specifically, to help you avoid spending a whole bunch of money on something that's all name and no substance. And thus, today's episode is going to be all about retro gaming money traps. Games that are very expensive due to low numbers or some kind of controversy, but won't provide you with years of memorable gameplay. As usual, I'm going to be focusing on games that were released exclusively in Japan, since I think most collectors probably have a good idea already of which US NES and SNES games are really worth it. And so, in no particular order, we are starting out with... Sapphire for the PC Engine CD. Sapphire has been notoriously expensive for a very long time. If memory serves me, it was going for over 500, even 10 years ago or more when I still lived in the States. Sapphire is particularly notorious as it may be the only game developed specifically for the arcade card, which was the most powerful RAM card made for the PC Engine. Most of the other arcade card games were, as the name suggests, arcade ports, with a couple computer ports as well. Graphically, the game does some unbelievable stuff for the hardware it's running on, which is great and all, but as a shooter it's mediocre at best. It's definitely not a crap game, but decidedly below average. To be honest, I was suspicious almost as soon as I started playing the game, as it doesn't take long to discover that, of the four selectable characters, three of them are so slow that the game is practically unplayable with them. Not the mark of a great game. Most of the bosses require you to remember what part of the screen to be on to avoid each pattern. Things that just fly at you so quickly, there's no way to avoid them with skill. And it's short. Five levels, and the last one is barely a full level. I'm sorry to break the hearts of those who have never played it and dreamed of one day owning a legitimate copy, but it is not a great game by any means. They really should have gotten the team who made the soldier games to program it. Moving on. My next big warning to potential collectors is Blast Wind for the Sega Saturn. This is a vertically scrolling shooter developed by Technosoft, who you probably know and love for making the Thunder Force games. Hey, it's a 2D shooter on the Saturn by the makers of Thunder Force. Graphics look awesome, music's done by Tsukumo Hyakutaro, so that's bound to kick ass, and it's expensive. People wouldn't be willing to pay that much money for it if it wasn't good, would they? Sadly, when you actually sit down and play Blast Wind, you'll find a shooter that adds nothing to the genre whatsoever, which would be fine, but the actual gameplay is completely forgettable. It's fast paced, yes, but the standard enemies just keep flying onto the screen in a variety of zigzags and you'll just keep blasting them down and toss a bomb here and there. It's not really entertaining. Really the worst part is the bosses. It's a vertical shooter and there's a sidebar, so the playing field is limited to begin with. But the bosses are huge and always have you cramped into a tiny little space at the bottom of the screen, giving you very little time to react to anything. They're all extremely claustrophobic and give you no chance to learn how to actually use skills to avoid the patterns. To my knowledge, this thing sells for a good 250 without the spine card. The content of the game is not worth that kind of money. Next up is a game that I think may hold the record for the biggest disparity between price and gameplay of any Japan exclusive. It's Battle Mania 2 Daiginjo for the Sega Mega Drive. The first Battle Mania came to the West under the name Troubleshooter. I remember when I first saw the name in a list of games, I thought it might actually be some kind of peripheral and not a game. The Battle Mania games are horizontal shooters made by Vic Takai, the kings of ripoff. They've managed to do substandard knockoffs of Sonic in their game Socket, and Imperium was a poor imitation of Musha Alesta. To give them credit, Battle Mania is not a ripoff of anything I can think of offhand. You play as two girls stuck together who traverse Japanese towns and fantasy labyrinths to put a stop to some evil plot. Not a horrible idea by any means, and in fact, the graphics and music in Battle Mania 2 are extraordinary. 
I dare say the soundtrack may be in the top 5 Mega Drive soundtracks of all time, and that's not an easy club to get into. The game does have personality, but Vic Takai just didn't have the experience of making shooters, and there is absolutely nothing to the gameplay. I beat the game on hard mode the first time I ever played it, and you probably would too. No intense bullet dodging, no particularly thoughtful boss patterns to learn. It's really unfortunate, because it's got presentation, but nothing else. They must have made very few copies, because now it sells for over 400, and that's on Yahoo Auctions Japan. Stores are generally asking 600. My friends, you will not get $600 worth of enjoyment out of Battlemania Daiginjo. Be warned. Next I'll briefly talk about Rakugaki Showtime for the PlayStation 1. A treasure game, you may be asking. How dare you! Treasure is without a doubt my favorite developer. Doesn't mean they've never made a bad game. Actually, this is more like a footnote because it seems like everyone has already realized that Rakugaki Showtime isn't a good game. It's way cheaper now than it was 10 years ago. I think it can easily be had for less than 100. It's just a 4 player battle royale style game where you throw objects littered around the field at the other players. That's all. The graphics are pretty cool because they look like animated scribbles, but it doesn't add anything significantly enjoyable to the experience. This is around the time that Treasure fell out of their short-lived partnership with Enix, so there aren't many copies, but that doesn't mean it's worth your time. You know, if they had just taken this engine and made another scrolling beat-em-up, kind of like Guardian Heroes, it probably could have been damn fun. It's a shame. The last game for today is the despicable Cyvarier 2 for the Dreamcast. I know there are people watching this right now saying, How dare you! I own Cyvarier and I love it! It's trash and you know it! You're just trying to justify the amount of money you spent on it in a desperate attempt to cover up the cognitive dissonance. Now, Cyvarier 2 only costs around 100, which is hardly even mid-range by today's standards. However, that's 110 too much. The game literally throws showers of bullets at you with no rhyme or reason at all. Instead of executing skill to avoid them, you press the control pad back and forth, which makes your character spin, making you borderline invincible. It's an embarrassment to video gaming. There is not one redeeming quality to it. The music is pointless techno, so you can't even squeeze a decent soundtrack out of the purchase. I can't believe that success went from developing Guardian Force to this. Avoid it like the plague. So there you have it. Five games that fetch high prices, but just aren't worth the money. I've owned all of them at one point or another, and I have no regrets selling them back. Well, I wish I had held on to Battle Mania 2 a little bit longer so I could have sold it at a profit, but whatever. That was way back before the great price spike. The moral of the story? Not all expensive games are great. That's all for today's episode, guys. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Please think your purchases through carefully, and happy gaming.